Our main presentation today is Modern Art Explained Using Art by Women uh, by Dennis Fair. Dennis is a member of our community here. He grew up in a mechanized Amish community and has been fascinated by drawing since he, as he says, able to see over the armrest of his father's easy chair. During his career, he has taught art to many people from kindergartners to uh, jail inmates. He's consulted for the U.S. Department of Education as well as for foreign governments. He's published three books, has lectured and made art in 19 countries. His work is in collections in six countries and my townhouse. <laughs> Dennis presently teaches art and economics at the Fusion Academy here in Houston. Please help me welcome Dennis Fair. Good morning, Oasis. Look at all those pretty faces out there. Um, I want to welcome our visitors. We're glad that you chose us this morning. And um, uh, in fact, if, if you would indulge me, if you're a first timer, would you raise your hand? Okay, look around, everybody. Those are the people you want to introduce yourselves to when I'm done. I'd appreciate it if you wait till I'm done. Um, okay, so we're going to chat a little bit today. Uh, let's see. I was told to push F5. Hey, <laughs> could we have the lights off, please? This is not a art lecture room action. Very. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. Yikes. Um, they're way, way more colorful than that. Okay. Uh, women artists in the modernist century, we're going to look at two things this morning. One is how modernism even happened. What was the point of giving art over to being abstract? I will explain that this morning. Another. Uh, kind of a text that we'll be addressing this morning is differences in how male artists portrayed women subjects compared to how female artists portrayed women subjects in what we call the modernist century, which started in the 1860s with the French Impressionists and ended in the 1960s with what we call conceptual art. So that's today's agenda. Um, okay. Uh, an artist you never heard of probably, Rosa Bonheur, French artist, um, as you can see, painted in the mid 1800s, called the Horse Fair. Uh, you, you certainly don't see anything abstract about this because I wanted to show you where art was at the dawn of modernism. Here we're not there yet. It's a decade away. But what we see here is what I call Renaissance-based realism, which was the dominant style uh, from the Renaissance forward and uh, remains popular today as it should. But a little bit about Rosa Bonheur. She um, uh, wanted to be an artist. She got support from her parents to be an artist, but in, 18, in the 18, mid-18th century, women just didn't do that. They were restricted to um, fiber art kinds of expressions, sewing and quilting and weaving and knitting and so on. That's pretty much the box that they were locked into. She wanted to do oil on canvas, same as the boys. She loved animals. And at twice a week, she was living in England at this time, twice a week there would be horse fairs, men only. So for a year and a half, when she was a young woman, she disguised herself as a man and went to the horse fairs, brushes 
and canvas in hand. She painted, this, this painting is eight feet tall. So I don't know how, <laughs> how she logistically managed that, but she did. And um, it took her a year and a half to finish. After she finished it, she came out of the closet. She said this was painted by a woman artist. And instead of being condemned for it, as fate would have it, she was widely embraced, became very popular for what she had done, and she became the most famous woman artist in Europe during her lifetime. You never heard of her because she was buried under a patriarchal art history. There she is, self-portrait. We notice some things. <clears throat> the background is rather drab. It looks like it might be a wall in her studio where she hung up a cloth for one reason or another. Uh, she's wearing kind of a drab brown dress. Her hair doesn't look like she maybe spent a lot of attention on it. She's there with her paint-covered apron and her brushes in hand. This is an unromanticized self-portrait of a very serious artist. Meanwhile, the boys were painting women differently. You might have heard of Gustave Courbet. He's in all the art history books. He, a contemporary of Rosa. And um, here we see a woman um, drunken and apparently unconscious and uh, quite voluptuous and um, available. <clears throat> all right. So, here's what changed the art world in the mid-1800s. The camera. All of a sudden, you could sit for 10 minutes. Those early cameras took a while to expose onto the plate. You could sit for 10 minutes, have your photograph taken, or you could still go and sit for 10 hours while the artist painted you. Well, guess what people started doing? Am I speaking clearly and can you hear me? Okay. That... Slowly? Give the artist names? Oh, yeah, I am, I am giving the name. Thank you, though. Yeah. Um, this is Mary Cassatt, and I'll talk about her in a minute. The camera, okay, so now it, it was invented in 1839 and within five years it was known and used around the world. So imagine how that cut into how artists made a living. Portraits, historical events, scenery, etc., and Color photography came along, believe it or not, almost immediately in the form of painting the printed photograph. So artists were backed against the wall. Some of them embraced photography. They stopped being artists and they became photographers. Others um, hated photography and uh, did everything they could to keep it down, which was a, a pointless task. So what happened was, after a few decades, artists had been grappling with how to paint. What, what do we do now? And we give the French Impressionists credit for being the first ones to do something about that. They started painting like this. If you look at this painting, it's not Renaissance-based realism. It's blurrier than that. 
That's a perfect example of the Impressionist style. Now, Mary Cassatt was the one woman who carried any weight in the Impressionist group, although there were as many women Impressionists working as there were men. And you've heard of, of, of Monet and all of the guys. You haven't heard about the women. They, too, were buried under a patriarchal art history. But Mary Cassatt was like Rosa Bonheur. She somehow broke through the ceiling and became known and respected. Um, when, when Edgar Degas, another Impressionist, saw her work, he said this, I don't believe a woman could draw like this. Did you really do it by yourself? And um, she must have forgiven him because they went on to become very good friends. Very good <laughs> friends. <clears throat> so um, meanwhile, the uh, boys, again, in the Impressionist movement, um, Auguste Renoir, you've heard of him, when I've painted a woman's bottom so that I want to touch it, I know I'm done. I would never have taken up painting if women did not have breasts. Uh, there's, there's one more I, I want to add that I, I didn't put in. Actually, most of this is in a book I wrote about it. Um, but, but here's one for, for the ages from from uh, Renoir. I consider women writers, lawyers, and politicians to be monsters and nothing but five-legged calves. The woman artist is merely ridiculous, but I am in favor of the female singer and dancer. He also said, I paint with my and I'll let you substitute whatever euphemism you wish for the penis. That was Renoir. Okay, Anna Ancher you never heard of either. Um, if I'm wrong about that, and any of you have, I apologize, but most of these women are just, um, only, only in the last 20 or 30 years are we even knowing they existed, thanks to feminist art historians. <clears throat> so anyway, there she is. What's interesting about this painting, she's sewing. She paints a woman doing the kind of art that women were permitted to do. It's a lovely painting. It's kind of, uh, we see an Impressionist influence. This is 1890 now. Um, we're moving now into what's called post-Impressionism more, but she still borrows from the Impressionist, but not heavily. There's still kind of a note of Renaissance-based realism in here. Anyway, she um, is from Denmark, and uh, during her lifetime, she became um, highly regarded in that country and, and had a successful career. Not that many did. Okay, the post-impressionist boys, you've heard of Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. Um, there he is doing it, his deal um, with a woman sexually on display. <clears throat> Suzanne Valadon, another French painter. I love this painting. Um, 1923, let, let's look at what's going on here. First of all, I, I note, if, if you look at the, um, the upper center of the painting, it kind of looks like something done in the 1950s in, uh, when abstract expressionism was going on. So that's kind of shocking to see in a painting done in 1923. And there's also kind of a flattening of, if you look at the blue drapery with the white flowers, uh, it, it looks kind of flattened out. Her body is painted, even though she's a heavy set woman, her body is painted somewhat flatly and the background is right there behind her. There's a shallowness of space that we associate with modernism also. 
the, the, the space kept moving closer and closer until finally uh, in the 1950s and 60s it disappeared altogether. Um, but, so how does she portray this woman? She's smoking. Um, she is, she, her body does not conform to stereotypes of feminine beauty. She's not looking at us. She doesn't care about us. She's being who she is. When Suzanne Valadon painted men, <laughs> turnabout is fair play. <clears throat> oh, a, a, a little bio about Suzanne. Um, she was born to a single mom, never met her dad, and when she was nine, she started working in a laundromat because she had to support herself. Nine. <clears throat> Natalia Goncharova, Russian painter, one of the isms in the early 20th century, there was this cluster of isms, cubism and fauvism, and um, in, in this case, what's called futurism, it, an, an ism that emerged in Italy, um, but Natalia was part of that group. Uh, what they set out to do in this century-long quest to find out a new way to paint, um, one of the ideas they came up with was depicting physical motion in a, the static medium of oil on canvas. And so we get paintings like this. And when we look at this, we see that she had completely mastered the style. It's a gorgeous example of futurism. Um, Natalia, again, was a bit of a case. Uh, she, being Russian, uh, she lived with a man she wasn't married to. She wore men's clothes fairly often. Um, and uh, the Russian Orthodox Church gave her a really hard time for that and tried to close down her shows and things like that. So she had to put up with quite a bit from the church. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Jean Metzinger, a French painter, borrows from Cubism and Futurism and continues the tradition of the man painting the naked lady. Speaking of Cubism, Lyubov Popova, Russian painter, um, clearly someone who understood Cubism and was uh, quite successful at it. And we can compare her to someone you have heard of, Pablo Picasso. This is one of his many versions of Cubism, a style that he and a friend of his, Georges Braque, invented together. <clears throat> now, we saw Mary Cassatt, mother and child. If you recall, the mother's face was turned away from us toward the child, conveying to us that her priority is not us, it's her child. That's a subject matter that men stayed as far away from as they possibly could. They were more interested in painting women closer to the point of conception rather than parenting. And um, Picasso, male chauvinist that he was, was one of the few artists during the modernist, one of the few male artists during the uh, uh, modernist century who did. And I lectured on him a few months ago and I showed these same slides. But there he is, uh, showing us a sensitive side, a man who didn't seem to have much of a sensitive side, and yet he could do gorgeous, tender, loving portrayals of mother and child like these two. The one exception to that, the mother-child theme for men, uh, was um, the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. Tons and tons and tons of those 
throughout the Middle Ages, throughout the Renaissance, the Baroque, neoclassical, a lot of it. Um, but that was the exception, the clear exception. Okay, um, Frida Kahlo, you have heard of her in all likelihood, Mexican surrealist. She smoked. She couldn't find any women to box in the ring with her, so she boxed with men. She drank men under the table in tequila contests. She wore men's clothes on occasion. She was openly bisexual. This is a self-portrait. She was in a very bad accident as a teenager in a streetcar. A, a steel shaft actually got rammed into her abdomen and she never fully recovered from it. There are photographs of her painting bedridden, which is how she spent a fair amount of her life with a little easel built up across her lap. And um, <clears throat> she painted women's realities, birth, breastfeeding, abortion, miscarriage. And she had a, a kind of a surrealist bent, and we see that here. We see all of that here in this one painting. Meanwhile, speaking of surrealists, there's Salvador Dali. This is his wife, Gala. He got all the important parts of her in no head, but uh, 1977. Okay, now we're in we're in the. Uh, Surrealism basically we associate with the 1930s mostly, although we still see the, uh, the influence of it all over the place. Um, what happened after Surrealism is World War II. That was another game changer. The artists are still trying this. We see all these isms going on, and artists are just experimenting and looking, still, still puzzled about where visual art fits into the world now. And World War II comes along. <clears throat> and um, this painting is by Jackson Pollock. And uh, emerging from World War II, art did this. It went totally abstract. There's no reference in here to sunsets or vases of flowers or even naked women. This is all about the lines, the shapes, the textures, and the colors, and whatever they represent. Now, they often represented certain things, but not discernible to the viewer. So this was, this was about as thin as art had ever been. You notice this, as abstraction gets more and more severe, it kind of had only one direction to go in. And, and so in the 1950s, uh, late 40s and 50s, it was here. This is what Pollock had to say. The modern painter cannot express this age of the airplane, the atom bomb, the radio, in the old forms of the Renaissance, each age finds its own technique. The modern artist is living in an age when we can represent nature mechanically with the camera. So artists today express an inner world. Now, here, here's one of the gals, one of the abstract expressionists, Joan Mitchell. This is what she had to say. I paint my feelings of remembered landscapes. My paintings repeat feelings about Lake Michigan, water, or fields. They're more like poems. I could never mirror nature. I would rather paint what nature leaves with me. And those two comments, Pollock and Mitchell, are about as close as we can get to understanding 
their work. So, following all that energy that we see in abstract expressionism, the next generation needed to push the abstraction envelope farther. Well, they could get rid of abstract expressionist energy. Now, 1959, minimalism. This is the one that parents say my five-year-old could do that. An understandable comment, but if you look at the history of the modernist century, it fits. This was the next step. Yves Klein, Agnes Martin, another minimalist, she made a couple of comments about her work. People look at my painting and say it makes them happy, like the feeling when you wake up in the morning. The measure of our lives is the amount of beauty and happiness of which we are aware. Art is a concrete representation of our most subtle feelings. So, uh, her last comment is interesting. Art is a concrete representation of our most subtle feelings. In other words, there is that artifact on the wall. There is that oil on canvas object that you can pick up and touch. Now where do we go? What's beyond this? What's more abstract than this? There was one thing left. <laughs> you just take away the object. Performance art. Marina Abramovich, performance artist. Um, this piece, it's called Rhythm Zero Performance. I don't get the title. But what this was about, for six hours, if you've ever been to the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, you know that you walk in and, and there's a huge round open area and then uh, the staircase goes in a spiral. It's Frank Lloyd Wright building. Anyway, um, she, her deal here was to stand in the middle of that first floor area, motionless and silent for six hours. Next to her was a table. It had 72 objects of various kinds, things you find in the kitchen or in your closet or just nothing unordinary about these things. Common objects, 72 of them. One of them was a revolver with a bullet in it. You can go up to Marina and do anything to her, say anything to her, touch her. She'll stand there silent and motionless for six hours. So, after an hour or so, she had very few clothes left. And a guy comes up to her and picks up the pistol. And got a photograph of it. Holds it up to her. Now, this is my conjecture. If you're going to do that, you, you would want to put the bullet in the sixth chamber. So they go click, 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 click five times before you get shot. <clears throat> well, he, when, the, when the spectators saw him raise the gun like this, they assaulted him and stopped it. What did she do? Nothing. Six hours are up. Clear the table, put the table away. 
we're done. That was her art creation. Nothing to collect, nothing to hang on the wall, nothing to buy. Conceptual art. On the guy's side, v oh, one, one last thing about her. A note, note that she put herself, this, we're going to reference this in a second. Note that she put herself in a powerless position. <clears throat> now, Vito Acconci, another conceptualist, comes along. This is one of his pieces. He calls it the following piece. He would get up in the morning, go out onto the street, go ahead and get coffee at the coffee shop, whatever. He would pick somebody at random. And without that person knowing it, he would follow that person for the entire day, documenting it, and that person would never know that he had done it. Notice the power shift, the gender-based power shift from helplessness to, in a way, owning part of a person's life without them knowing about it. You know about it. They don't know that their privacy is being invaded. Lack of power, presence of power. Okay, so, uh, 1969, so we're basically at the end of the modernist century now because after you eliminate the object itself, there's just truly no place to go next. So what, now what? We thought up a new way of painting in the 1860s that got us through a century of art history. Now we have to do it again. There was, there was chatter about the death of visual art. All we're going to have left now throughout history is going to be theater and dance and music and, and literature. Not too many people took that seriously, understandably. But the question was then, what? So, a group, small group of artists working in uh, New York City came up with a style called pop art. And lo and behold, the recognizable image is back. That's what we do next, thanks to Andy Warhol, and in this case, Marisol Escobar, um, a, a sculptor who uh, did a very desexualized portrayal of the male figure, this Lyndon Johnson, who was president at the time, I think. And, um, and it's, a, it's political commentary. There's a mocking aspect to her portrayal of him. But it's a very good uh, example of, of how the art community resolved the dilemma of what we do next. We do pop art. And here is the male version of that. Tom Wesselman, very uh, successful pop artist. I think she's, you know, saying, oh God, I'm not sure she's praying. Um, but I'll leave that up to you. One, one thing left, and, and I'm ending it in the 1970s. Um, after the pop artists came along, <clears throat> it's as if artists felt this hunger to sort of go back to photography and give it a little bit of a spanking and, and say, see, we survived you a movement called photorealism pretty much dominated the 1970s. That's oil on canvas. Here the idea was to develop a very high level of technical skill so that you could make a painting that looked exactly like a photograph. And quite a few artists 
jumped on this bandwagon. It was kind of a big deal for a while. And here we have an, Audre, an artist named Audrey Flack, um, who not only was one of the foremost um, photorealists of that decade, and, and as far as I know, she's still working. Um, but what she painted here also is interesting. In, it, we're, we're looking both at the development of art across this time period, but we're also looking at gender relationships here. And she, she picks one of the great sexual icons in all of history, Marilyn Monroe, and she creates this vanitas, a, a little assemblage of objects in memory of a deceased person. It is an honor for that particular person. And so she um, takes Marilyn out of her sexual role and actually puts her in kind of what many people would say is a religious or a spiritual context by pre presenting her um, in this vanitas. <clears throat> and the one guy example, and I do step out of the 1970s for this one slide, um, but, I, at, but I end on this wonderful positive note. This is a male artist, Ron Muke. His subject matter is not only mother and child. Oh, by the way, he's a photorealist sculptor. They were also those, photorealist painter. I got fooled by a photorealist sculpture once. I was in a, um, a museum, and I was in a room by myself except for an elderly woman sitting on a bench. And, um, and I was walking around looking at the art, and you know, every once in a while, she would fall within my line of sight, and not budging. <laughs> and you know, what? So I kind of approach her, and um, she's not acknowledging me. And I got right up to her, and it was about then that I thought, oh, Art joke. <laughs> but then I looked at her closely. It was by an artist named, um, uh, his last name is Hanson. Any, any art people here? Um, Dwayne Hanson. Dwayne Hanson. It was one, of, and I knew about him, and I, I knew right away that had to be a Dwayne Hanson piece. But even the fingernails, even the fingernails looked like a real person's hand. So anyway, Ron Muke comes along. He, he's uh, obviously technically insanely good. Um, and notice also, um, you, see, you see the viewer on the right. Um, he does his, this particular piece at about two-thirds scale. So you'll never mistake this for a living person, unlike what Dwayne Hansen did. Muke always makes the the figure too large or too small. And um, so uh, to me, that's a measure of genuine progress that we have made as a culture where there's so much work to be done, but we have come so far. Those of us my age look back at how women were in society, where they were when I was a child compared to today, no one will ever convince me we haven't made substantial progress. We have. Thank you.